Hello Matrix and hello friends and welcome to yet another video and we're just going to pick up from where we left uh, welcome back I hope you guys have had good holidays and you got to rest a little bit and you gave yourselves a bit of what you probably enjoy outside school and outside school work got to travel a little bit so your relatives friends and you know wherever else where you can find to sort of diffuse the pressure so now we're back at it so let's just not waste any more time and just get to the work and see how far we can go otherwise uh, I'm going to make it a little bit different this time we're going to try and tackle some IEB questions as well some of you have been suggesting that and on top of that um, even for the DBE guys I would suggest that please try as many of these IEB papers as you can, especially the most recent ones. Say from the last two, three years until now, just try to practice as many questions that are relevant, of course, to your syllabus. But you will see the technicalities and the style of questioning, maybe, you know, that can help to solidify your approaches as well. Like I said, we are basically trying to perfect our approach to answering these questions. Uh, we won't necessarily get the answers all the time. That's not the purpose of doing these videos. It's not just the actual answer, but mainly the way towards getting that answer. And at times you'll realize that some of the approaches, there are some errors which are in everybody. And you will see that we don't really get the right answer, but with the right approach, of course, and that helps as well for you to understand why you were wrong because you also don't want to work something out and when you get to see that you were wrong but you don't understand why so it helps a lot and I can see some of you guys are really helpful you do point out some of the mistakes that I commit as we go along and I pray that you continue to have that spirit to share your opinions to share your suggestions and certainly to correct when I am wrong because I still have that potential to be wrong. Other than that, I want us to keep working together to get that best mark for those who will be writing the final exams this year and so that you can reach your goals. Okay, so now let's have a look at this physical science paper one from November 2020. Okay, so you can just get this paper. It's not very easy though because it's not yet readily available, but if you'll be willing to find the paper, uh, you can just email me and so that you can get a copy. So my email address basically is zamo.makamba okay, at gmail.com. Okay, so it's all small letters, Z-A-M-O dot m a k h a m b a so that is zamo dot makamba at gmail dot com so you can email me here and request a copy of this question paper if you be willing to have it uh, that is free of charge of course I'm not <laughs> I'm not selling the paper it's not mine so yeah so just if of course if you can't read this or you just missed it please check in the channel and you will see. I'll probably write it in the description as well so that you can have it. Other than that, let's just work. So, again, pay attention to general instructions and what do exactly, what is the most important? I mean, the rest is the topography of the paper and how many are going on and where are things that you need. But what is important is number seven. It says show your working in all calculations. So that is the most important. And then, of course, I would rather you also pay attention to 9 because it says you must express your answers in decimal format. That means you're not going to leave it as improper fractions, okay? If you leave it at that, you're not getting an answer because they're already telling you that whenever you get an improper fraction as an answer, take it down to a decimal. And then, of course, the standard two decimals after your comma all right but of course that's the minimum you can even go more because when they say 
uh, oh by the way this one also dictates that you only do two two but in the DBE papers they tell you that at least meaning two or more but here they're saying stick to the two all right so let's not waste too much time and just start working so that we don't make this video long so I'm going to try and tackle just paper one I mean question one which is the MCQs and from there we just keep working until we end this paper okay now it says of course you're going to read all the general instructions but I'm just going to zoom in to the local instructions which is the actual question because it has its own dictations for you to follow but you also have the general ones that you also need to keep in mind okay now question 1.1 says the object sorry an object of weight fg is on a plane inclined at an angle theta to the horizontal okay as shown so we have a diagram there and we can see there is our angle theta and there is our object on that incline okay now it says which of the following which of the following options correctly state the components of the weight in the plane of the coordinate axes shown in the diagram you see now this coordinate axes they have shown that means this part here dictates how you're going to decide the signs of your answers okay so now when we look at our diagram we know that we draw the components of weight one is the one that is perpendicular to the surface okay the other one is the one that is parallel to the surface isn't it so and in between them we have an angle of 90 degrees it's a pity now my fg is cut so those are the components of that weight and we know there that in between this is where our theta will be it's a pity it's a very small diagram so you know that if this is fg over here this is going to be fg perpendicular meaning it's perpendicular to the surface okay and this one is going to be fg parallel okay so that is fg parallel okay it's a pity my resolution may not be the best but yeah we'll try and see just zoom in a bit all right so <clears throat> we're going to decide now how we're going to work with this easy if we want fg parallel for example we can see that it is the side of this right angled triangle which is opposite that angle theta okay so we can use sine rule here and for sine rule to be applied we're going to say fine this is going to be essentially uh, fg okay sine of theta all right of course you can do the long way and say sine theta equals opposite of hypotenuse where it's going to be fg parallel divide by fg right and then you do fg parallel the subject of the formula and then it will get you this all right so i'm just i'm just trying to save a bit of time then now when we want fg perpendicular what are we going to do we can see that that fg perpendicular side is actually the side adjacent to that angle theta so that means we can use the trig ratio cos okay and then when we use that we're going to find out that this is going to be fg cos theta okay now we've done part of the work so what is the next thing we need to decide now what are the signs of these components based on the coordinate system that they gave us so we know that above the slope perpendicular to the slope and above that is positive that would mean perpendicular to the slope and below that slope is going to be negative so this means this sign here is negative okay and then we know also that the direction that is directed down slope it is negative as well and by the way we know that now our parallel component of that weight is also directed along that slope down and therefore it will also be negative so now we just want to look for these answers in our options here so let's see a says the x component remember the x component is the parallel component of the weight so it is minus fg sine theta and isn't it the same yes it is 
and then we look at the y component we said it's going to be minus fg cos theta as we saw there because this gives us the guide and therefore a is the answer without a doubt so you can check the others if you want but once you find the fitting answer please make sure that you don't waste time but at the same time double check in case you're making a mistake if you're looking here this is essentially a switch of what was happening above so that means the expressions are actually wrong okay but the signs are correct isn't it because we could see that both of them are negative but the only problem here is the expressions fg cos theta no it can't define the x component but it defines the y component so that is a switch then if you're looking at this one these ones are correct the expressions but the one thing that is wrong is the signs because they gave us a guide that we are to use this coordinate system that they designed okay or provided then we look at this one again it's just a switch everything is just wrong here the sign is wrong the expression is wrong so you can tell that no there's no way you're making a mistake for selecting a okay let's move <clears throat> so 1.2 says a block slides up and then down a rough incline okay which of the following graphs could represent the velocity of the block as a function of time okay so we want to do a velocity versus time graph here all graphs take up here as positive so you see they're giving you a guide as well so you're not gonna choose yourself they are choosing for you so see another dictation so now let's picture what is going on if we're thinking there's our slope okay we really don't know what is the incline so we can simply use theta okay now we're thinking here there's our object we don't know what this object is but we're just going to imagine it's a box okay now of course the box will have its weight directed straight down and it will be perpendicular to the horizontal so this is fg okay now this surface is rough okay so that means there's going to be friction and remember they said this box is sliding up and then down so that means it will slide up and then stop then come back down all right so this is the first instance when it's sliding up so let's just say this arrow here depicts the direction of motion all right not any components of the weight or any forces acting but what are the forces that are acting on this box in essence it's going to be the friction right you agree with me so it's going to be fk okay so we're going to have friction directed down slope okay that's the first force that is working on that object but what else is acting on that object the next thing that's acting on the object it's going to be of course remember this weight will also have its components it's a pit it's not going to be very clear but you will have the perpendicular and the horizontal but the perpendicular is just perpendicular to the direction of motion so it does not get involved in that because it will be cancelled out by the normal force by the surface on that object so the next one is going to be the parallel component of weight of the weight so this is going to be fg parallel okay so you can see that there's two forces that are acting in the same direction which is down slope so that means this object as it slides up it will decelerate it will decelerate until a point where it is stationary okay so we know here there's going to be a deceleration but now if we're taking up slope as positive that means down slope is going to be negative so that means that force is negative and this one is also negative okay so what do we expect we expect our deceleration to be much stronger because these forces are acting in the same direction so they will add together so they'll be summative so the resultant force is going to be down slope and so will be the deceleration or you can say acceleration okay not a problem so let's picture now the second scenario when this object is sliding down 
what will be the situation so there is our box also again this time the direction of motion is down okay so it's down slope so of course we still have our weight FG directed down and then it will have its components and they will be at 90 degrees to each other and then of course this is FG parallel and then that is FG perpendicular so what will happen oh by the way this is the rough incline now which forces are acting on this now what is the force that is acting down slope it is going to be the parallel component of weight it's FG parallel and remember it's directed in which direction down so this is going to be negative all right now what is the other force remember friction always opposes the direction of motion this time friction is going to be directed that way so our FK is going to be directed up and if it is directed up slope it's going to be positive all right so you can see here now the resultant force is definitely going to be much smaller than the resultant force in the first instance why because now it's just one force acting down and the other force acting up but in this case they were acting together in the same direction so they are summative now what do we expect we expect our acceleration here to be much bigger but because it's directed down slope we expect a negative gradient okay but that is steep but what will be the case here we will expect still the acceleration is going to be down slope because this this box or this object is going to be sliding down slope so it will still be accelerating down slope but because these two forces are cancelling each other up the resultant force is much smaller than it would be there so that means we still are going to get a negative gradient of acceleration but it will be much gentler and not as steep as in the first case okay not a problem so now we're thinking velocity versus time graph remember we know that in a velocity versus time graph you know that the gradient is representative of the acceleration all right not a problem so if we're looking at option a here it says we're moving at constant velocity and we know that this cannot be true why because if there are forces that result into what is called the resultant force then we are going to have acceleration so we can't go at constant velocity so option A is already out but here we have a bit of a situation now let's look at option B option B says we have a steep deceleration this is when the object is going up slope isn't it so we know that it started at some velocity when it was sliding from the beginning as it moves it decreases its velocity to zero as we said it's going to stop at some point and then turn back so this is when it is zero so this is cool it looks okay and then it still accelerates but in the negative side of our slope as in down slope so this is still okay but what is good is that this is steeper than this one so this is a very good candidate but let's look at the others this one says we have a constant deceleration because you can see that gradient is the same throughout and that cannot be true why because we know the first scenario the resultant force was bigger but in the second scenario the resultant force was much less because these two forces were now acting against each other and therefore it can't be the same uh, gradient it will change okay so C is eliminated now let's look at D D says we have a deceleration until it stops and then changes direction but here's the problem with this one it says this first part is gentler you can see that that slope is much less than this one but now how can you say that because we know the magnitude of acceleration in the first case is much steeper so this is wrong because of that it's the right direction of the acceleration it's the right gradient negative gradient but it is less steep therefore it can't be correct and this one too cannot be correct because we know at this point the second time around when it has changed direction it is accelerating much less than it was accelerating in the first part so this is basically a switch of this and therefore B is our 
golden answer because it captures the fact that the gradient is much steeper at the beginning then when it changes direction is much gentler because the acceleration is much less as those forces are cancelling each other out okay guys let's move i think i'm taking too long but the idea is so that you can capture why those answers are the best because still stand to be corrected so if you spot something let me know don't be afraid 1.3 says a stone is thrown vertically upwards with a speed now think about this they are saying speed not velocity so you don't have to worry about direction here because we just care for magnitude it's a scalar quantity so v from the top of a building okay now let's picture our building i always like to draw the structures that they provide me because if i don't i always find it difficult to so this is ground level so now we have this stone here this stone is thrown upward okay at velocity i mean speed v okay that's what they said speed v we know that it's going to go up but because of the effects of gravity it will stop and then turn down until it hits the ground so there's our stone on the ground and then there's our stone at, at, at its maximum height okay but we know for, for the fact that when it reaches the same level of the building where it was thrown from it will be already moving at the same velocity v so it leaves at the velocity v goes up there velocity is zero and then it starts increasing until it reaches the same speed from the same height and then it goes down and hits the ground okay not a problem now what are they saying again okay at the same time a second stone y is thrown vertically downwards okay with the same speed v air resistance is negligible okay so what do we see here they are saying, ah, my goodness, there is another stone. We'll just draw it next to that one. So this is stone Y. That was X. Okay. Now, X is thrown vertically down. So there is stone Y at the bottom there. But remember, it is thrown at the same velocity v that stone x was thrown up so remember at this height they are of the same velocity or okay let's not use the word velocity but same speed so if they leave this height at the same speed it doesn't matter that this one is going to take longer because it had to go up first yes it will take longer but guess what as they hit the ground they will hit it at the same speed you know Let's just say V final. Because it's going to be the same. Why? Because they leave the top of the building with the same speed down. Spare that this one took the longer route before it did that. Okay, now let's answer the question. Question says, which one of the following statements is true about the speed at which the stones hit the ground? See speed that they hit the ground. It will be the same. Okay? Because of the fact that they leave the top of the building with the same speed downward the only difference is that this one will hit the ground first and then stone x will hit the ground much later okay now it says the speed of stone x is greater than the speed of stone y that is incorrect because now we know as they hit the ground is going to be the same the speed of stone y is greater than okay that's wrong again the speed of stone x is equal to the speed of stone y that is the most correct why you know the explanation right so let's just draw some windows there <laughs> okay no problem so some nice flat over there all right so the speed of the speed of stone x can only be compared to the speed of stone y when this height of the building is known well we don't really need to know the one thing that we know though is it is the same height we don't really actually need its magnitude at this point so c is the best answer okay not a problem let's keep moving guys i think i'm taking forever here i don't want to spend longer than 
30 minutes doing this. I hope I won't. All right, it says now a car has a mass M. All right, not a problem. So let's just picture our car there. Let's just draw some old school cars, very ugly cars. <laughs> so that's a problem. So there's our car. It has the mass M. Okay, now it says a person pushes the car with a force F. So there's our guy pushing this car. You know, he's pushing the car with the force F. Of course, the vector is going to be directed in that way. So there's our F. Okay, now he's pushing this car with that force F. Uh, for the car to have acceleration a so we know that this car is accelerating at that acceleration a okay now it says the person then pushes the car with a force 2f so now this person realizes no man i want to move this one maybe this car is <laughs> not moving as, at all so you want to kick it so when you want to kick it you must just push it a bit more so now this guy puts more effort he puts now twice the force that he gave and then to what acceleration 3a okay not a problem so now it says um, which expression is equal to the constant resistive force so what is constant resistive force basically this is kinetic friction because this car is moving right if it wasn't moving we're going to talk about static friction but since this car is in motion and it has this constant resistive force we know that we're talking about the frictional force but for a moving car we're going to talk about kinetic friction okay now it says which expression here I mean you see when you look here sometimes when you are given this kind of a scenario it is very detrimental to try and screen what the answer would be because it's very difficult these are some of those higher grade type questions because here you have to work it out instead so let's try to work it out so what do we have now looking at the scenario that we drew here first of all if this car is being pushed by this force F. So now if we're drawing a sort of, I don't know what you call this diagram, but now we're going to express our force here. But the friction is going to be that way, right? That is the story. So now for the first part, we know that the resultant force, according to Newton's laws, is the mass multiplied by the acceleration. But what is the resultant force? Is the applied force minus the frictional force, right? So that is our equation one, not a problem. So we are happy with this one. There's nothing much we can do here at this point. But now what is the story about the second scenario? The second scenario we have two times the force, but the friction still remains Fk because it is constant, right? And we know that the acceleration this time was 3a, okay? In the direction of the resultant force. So this means the resultant force equals mass times acceleration but now what is this this is 2f minus fk which is our friction equals now this time the acceleration is 3 so this is going to be 3ma isn't it so again we have our equation 2 now what do we do with this because guess what we want fk now so we want to isolate fk but now it becomes a little bit tricky now let's see what we can do about this situation so it looks like we're going to take a bit longer oh lord now let's think about this fine what if now because I see here we have two unknowns and we have two unknowns so we need to express one in terms of the other so this one is much easier we can say here from the top from equation one we can say that f equals what m a plus fk right when we transpose the fk isn't it because now this will help us to eliminate 2f so that we can work out fk because if we express 2f in terms of ma plus fk then we have a nice equation to work out our 
answer. So let's just take a bit of a page because it doesn't look like I will have enough space now to write. So let's just place it over here so that it doesn't look too far away. So now we can say therefore two, remember we're taking this one. In fact, you can say this is 1a if you like, um, but since we're working out MCQs, we're not really answering your question. Let's not complicate our lives. So you're going to say 2 into f is expressed as ma plus fk minus fk equals 3ma. All right. Not a problem. So we distribute the 2 inside. We get 2ma plus 2fk minus fk equals 3ma, okay? Now we can see that, look, these are like terms. So they will just work out together. 2fk minus just 1fk is just going to be fk equals. We transpose this one to the other side. So what we end up with is going to be 3ma minus 2ma which is equal to what? Just MA. So we know now for a fact that therefore our FK is going to be given by just MA. So do you see, it was not quite easy to tell that this would be the answer. You wouldn't really quickly spot out. So if you try to look at the options, but if you try to work it out, then you start to see, okay, 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 okay. It's not so bad. All right. Hope you understood that one now it says 1.5 a ball x moving horizontally collides with an identical ball y that is at risk so once they're saying identical this means they will occupy the same volume or spherical volume they are of the same weight okay maybe the only difference would be their velocities or charges if they were point charges but if we're saying identical we mean same weight if it is a spherical object, they'll occupy the same volume in space. And yeah, things like that. Now, what do we know? If this one is moving at velocity v, okay, let's just read co completely this, the statements. Ball x strikes ball y with velocity v. Okay? Now, what will happen here? Mind you, they're of the same weight. So obviously, when this one hits this one, it will just transfer all of its energy into that ball because they are all identical. So once it gets to this one, all the energy it has will be transferred to this one. And when it loses all of its energy, it will be standing still and this one will carry that velocity forward. So we want something that says this guy is stopping and that guy is moving. So it says which of the following is possible? I like this part, possible. It's not exactly what is going to happen, but it is possible by using our laws. Remember, all these laws are just simply models, scientific models, to explain what we observe so that we can be able to predict it. But it's not exactly, exactly, exactly accurate, but it is very close. It's a very close approximation. All right, so they're saying A, this one is going to move back and that one that way, that's not true. This one is going to have half the speed, half the speed, ah, doch, no ways, it's not possible. Uh, this one says they will both move in the same direction, but they can't move at the same speed for sure. But this one says ball X is going to be stationary and ball Y is going to be moving at V. So energy was transferred from this one to that one. That sounds correct. So we can go with D. All right, so let's look at 1.6. So 1.6 says, the graph below shows the magnitude of the resultant force acting on an object. Sorry, the graph below shows how the magnitude of the resultant force acting on an object changes as the object moves a distance uh, x. The object is initially at rest, but remember, they're telling us this is a resultant force. So we are using Newton's second law here. So this force here is actually the resultant force, not just any force, okay? Now this object is at zero there, stationary, and it's going to move in this direction, 
to get to that distance x okay so what does it say now what do we observe in this graph the resultant force was maximal there and then it kept decreasing as it moved in that direction decreasing decreasing until it was zero so here at distance x the resultant force is equal to zero so what does it mean when the resultant force of a moving object is zero it means we are going to start to do what constant velocity or constant speed whatever you're saying and that means it's no longer accelerating but as the resultant force is changing that means we are accelerating but of course some situations are very difficult to tell what is going on because we started from rest think of a car when we start from rest the car will have a little bit of an acceleration right to increase the speed so that we can move in that direction but here's what happens as we start moving forward if you ease up on your acceleration a little bit you will see that the acceleration will decrease but the speed will keep on increasing until you're no longer accelerating as you've lifted off that acceleration pedal then the car will essentially just attain a constant velocity so this is something like that because it's not really decelerating but it's just easing off the acceleration up until there's no more acceleration if there's no more acceleration that means we no longer have a resultant force but we are still moving okay now it says which of the following describes the kinetic energy and the acceleration so we're comparing kinetic energy and the acceleration of the object with this distance that it moved okay so we could see that well as we moved from rest to some constant velocity we had been accelerating right so if we've been accelerating we attained a maximum velocity and we've attained some velocity we know kinetic energy is half mv squared right so if we have a velocity definitely the velocity increased from zero to some maximal velocity then that means the kinetic energy will increase so anything that starts with a decrease on the kinetic energy is already a wrong option we don't really care whether this is correct or not but the fact that the combination already has a negative one then it doesn't work so that means the contenders is c and d now let's look what we said it will increase so it can be any one of the two but now what will happen to the acceleration remember we said we are easing off the acceleration as the car starts gaining momentum so that means we are decreasing the acceleration because the acceleration is directly proportional remember the resultant force is directly proportional to an acceleration according to Newton's law of motion the second one right so now if the resultant force is decreasing the acceleration is decreasing as well so that means we are sitting with C because it cannot be increasing when the resultant force is dropping because when it drops to zero acceleration is also zero okay so not a very easy question as well because it's a bit of a challenging to think about you can put an asterisk there and say it's one to truly consider as you keep working all right let's look at 1.7 1.7 says a box is pushed with a force three newtons for two seconds okay how long was this force applied two seconds only along a frictionless track so that means we don't lose energy okay there's our diagram you can see the force and of course if the force is directed that way this box is going to move in that direction as well and it's going to accelerate in that direction so this is the direction of motion direction of acceleration direction of the force fine now it says there's the graph they've drawn for us so we can see that this box was at rest okay and for these two seconds we have a steep positive gradient and guess what what is this acceleration so we accelerated from zero to a speed or velocity of 0 0.5 meters per second and in the direction of motion and we can tell that from two to seven seconds which is just five seconds we were doing constant velocity and that means acceleration in this segment is zero okay so that means the acceleration is zero there's no longer a force applied okay it's like when you're pushing this box and if it is frictionless it's just going to pretty much 
propel itself forward because of its momentum and you know why momentum is, has relate relation to um, the velocity of the object and its kinetic energy of course that it attained by the time it got there not a problem so it says now how much work is done by the force acting on the box hmm. what are we going to do here well if we want work we know that work is going to be the force applied essentially the resultant force uh, times what you call delta x which essentially gives us a horizontal distance cos theta of course cos theta just tells you this is not just a mere distance it's a vector of whatever distance you've gone so it has to do with uh, what is called displacement and then of course we used to have this situation that is called in fact our formula in the days was work equals the force multiplied by s s portrayed at displacement which will treat the same way but yeah you have this simplified uh, I, I don't think it's simplified in fact it's horrible but yeah <laughs> you like it anyway you've gotten used to it so now let's have a look here for us to get the displacement what do we need we know that the area under the velocity versus time graph gives us the displacement of an object so we have to use our geometry here not a problem so we know now that our delta x is going to be essentially the area under the v versus time graph for the first two seconds right okay we're losing time guys so what is that it's a triangular structure so it's going to be half the base is going to be 2 remember the base is from here to there so this is 2 seconds multiplied by the height remember this is perpendicular like that so the height is going to be 0, 0,5 okay so half of 2 is 1 1 times 0, 0,5 is just 0, 0,5 we can just simply say meters because we know usually we use meters per second here even though they didn't state for us but since we know the time is seconds that should be meters per second okay so there's our delta x okay so now we can come back and substitute into our formula this tells us that our work is going to be the force is 3 newtons right multiplied by delta x is 0, 0,5 times cos what is going to be theta remember the force is perpendicular I mean sorry it's parallel to the direction of motion so the angle there is going to be 0 degrees and in essence we just have 3 times 0, 0,5 because cos of 0 is 1 so this is just going to be 1,5 joules okay so where is that that is A so here you don't even have to look at anything else so that's what it is but of course you can check why those others maybe are possibilities and you will see why they will not fit the question at hand okay not a problem uh, let's move a bit faster because I think we took longer than I wanted to anyway so it says 1.8 a positive point charge Q1 um, and a negative point charge Q2 of equal magnitude so the magnitude is the same but different signs right I held at position at fixed positions y is halfway between q1 and q2 okay that's not a problem so um let's just shade our q1 uh blue because this is going to be a bit technical and then we shade our q2 pink whatever that color is all right so it says now which of the following combinations gives the direction of the net electric field so actually we're just looking at the net electric field but remember the net electric field is a vector okay so it would always have direction so we need to treat it as such it's not just magnitude so now it says which of the following combinations gives the direction of the net electric field due to the charges q1 and q2 at positions x y and z okay now let's look at x first okay 
x here the what you call if you think about it the what is this electric field due to the blue one which is q1 is going to be directed to the left why because we know that a positive charge the electric field is directed away from the center of that charge isn't it but for a negative charge the electric field is directed towards the center of that charge isn't it so this is on those basis that we would know so you can tell that x though is very close to charge q so it is going to be much bigger okay but now what about because of q2 because we know that q2 is a negative charge so the electric field is going to be directed towards that charge but because it's very far away it's going to be small okay, i'm just going to do it in a broken fashion because it's going to mess up my diagram so at x q2 the red one is pulling less because you know that the distance is on the denominator and is is the square so it's always going to be very very weak the far you are from the charge but because we are close here what does it tell us um, this tells us clearly that the resultant electric field due to these two is going to follow that one so this is the electric field resultant due to these two at point x so it's going to be directed to the left okay so we know anything that starts with x right is wrong okay so this can't be correct it can't be correct it's to the left because we know that those electric field strengths are different it's stronger as you are closer to the charge but because this one is only far away so it's going to be less therefore the resultant is going to be leftwards so that means we only have two options now to make sure we get right okay not a problem. Hey guys, I'm taking forever. Ne? Sorry man. Sorry man, we're almost done anyway. So let's look at this one. This one says, uh, hmm. What is happening at Y? Of course, we said the charge is going in that direction. So at Y, we know that the field, because of the blue one, which is the charge Q1, it's a positive charge, so it's going to be directed that way. What about Q2? Q2 is going to be doing the same thing because it's a negative charge. So they are both going in the same direction. Okay. And what does it tell us about our resultant? Our resultant is essentially going to be the sum of those two. And that is our electric field resultant. Okay. So it's going to be to the right. So now which one? Left, left right right so both of these first two part portions are correct so we still have to continue checking now at z what is happening we know that this charge is going to be pulling i mean pushing the electric field in that direction but look at the distance it is so far away from this so it's going to be weaker compared to this one due to q2 which is going to be bigger why because it's very close to the charge so what does it tell us the net electric field here is going to be directed towards that charge so so you can see that those resultants at those points are directed towards first the left the right the left so left right left so d is now the answer because this one is incorrect okay not a problem let's just move now it says uh, a battery with internal resistance is connected to a fixed resistor a voltmeter is connected across the battery fine now it says the battery is replaced by one with the same emf but with a larger internal resistance now you know once it has a larger internal resistance what happens due to the so-called V prime or lost volts the V external will decrease isn't it this time around 
Now it says now what happens to the reading on the voltmeter and the current through the fixed resistor. The fixed resistor is the external circuit. So we know that the V external because of the larger internal resistance of this battery with the same EMF is going to lose more energy before it even supplies the circuit. Now what it happens, what is going to happen is um, the V external drops but because of Ohm's law V equals IR this is fixed and then the temperature will be fixed so that means if you're dropping this guy that guy drops as well because they're direct, directly proportional so the answer here is going to be the voltmeter of the external circuit will decrease as well as its current okay of course keeping everything else constant not a problem so let's do the last one now it says four loops of wire move uh, with velocity v near a long straight conductor okay four loops of wire they are moving at velocity near a long straight conductor okay not a problem let us see what we can do about that story so last question right this is 1.10 it's not 1.10 don't say 1.10 please <laughs> 1.10 okay so now look at this we have a current carrying conductor directed upward okay we know that a current carrying conductor will have a magnetic field around it okay not a problem but now let's just consider ourselves a nice diagram because I think it's very difficult to picture what is going on there so let's just have our current carrying conductor with the current of course going in that direction okay so we know that these are placed here I'm going to make them a little bit 3D-ish so that we can be able to see what we need to be doing here and then that one is over there Ish, my position is killing me though guys alright so we're being told that this one is moving in that direction this one is moving in that direction and this one is moving in that direction and that one is moving in that direction okay so what do we know remember when we're talking this is essentially electromagnetic induction so we know that look we know that this will create a magnetic field around it in this fashion so i'm just going to do two circles but you know that there's many of them that act okay in that manner so it's not really the best drawing my position is killing me now look at this now when we talk about the magnetic field remember remember this has to do with something that okay these ones are moving at these velocities and the directions are very important okay now what is the question anyway which loop will have an induced anti-clockwise current okay now remember from Faraday's law we know that the EMF a Wenerman what is that EMF equals minus the number of cores multiplied by the change in the magnetic flux which is phi over the change in time okay but what is the magnetic flux that we know from grade 11 magnetic flux is defined by the strength of the magnetic field multiplied by the surface area vector okay uh, now when we talk about this surface area it is essentially the cross sec I mean the what you call is the entire I mean is the enclosed not actually the surface area of the wire itself but the enclosed surface area okay now let's think about it what is the direction of this field of the current carrying conductor use your right hand curl finger rule so your right hand the thumb points in the direction of the current the fingers will essentially point in the direction of uh, let's just zoom out a bit the fingers will actually curl in the direction of the magnetic field so we can see that if the current is going that way the field is coming out of these angles so you can see that the field here is going like that 
and then it's going in it's going up and then it's going in isn't it because that's how it goes okay or you can do that this side is going into this area and on this side it's going out of this area so now we have to think about the vector of that magnetic field so let me use another color so that we can work it out pretty nicely so if you think about it we're going to have here the perpen what do you call this the tangent the tangent vector of this magnetic field because remember using circles here is going to be directed exactly out of this so that means the magnetic field here is coming out now if you're using this as a dot it means it's coming out of the page so if we use this 3d structure it's going up like that okay that is the essence the magnetic field lines that are going to be due to this current are going to be coming out through this of course almost perpendicularly all right and then course tells you that this is the a normal vector of that area okay normal is always perpendicular to the surface given okay not a problem so this means even here the tangent to this is are going to be giving us a magnetic field that is directed upward and then this means here the vector is going down down okay so the tangent vectors are directed down okay not a problem so this is what is going to happen to these loops now um, what do we know about the induced current we know that from Ohm's law the current is directly proportional to the voltmeter isn't it and remember remember yeah guys I, I think I'm gonna take an hour I didn't plan to do this you know Hey, look, this thing is heavy, né? Now, remember, this negative says the change in the magnetic flux, I mean flux, will induce the EMF in the opposite direction of that change. Since these ones are related, that means the current will oppose every single change of that magnetic flux. It will induce such that it opposes that change. Now, that is the essence of this question. Now, think about it. If we're thinking here, what is happening? This one is moving into this diagram. I mean, it's going closer to the current carrying conductor. And if it is moving closer to the current carrying conductor, what is it doing? The magnetic flux is going to increase because the field lines close to this are much stronger than they are a bit far away. So this is going to do what? Induce a current which is going to oppose that because we're saying the current is related to our EMF, which is induced in an opposite direction of that flux so now we want the current that will oppose this change that we don't want to increase the field strength but we want to decrease it so now to decrease it we need to induce a current that will give us a perpendicular vector to that area that is directed opposite the vector of that magnetic field so that we can decrease it so that the net is zero now for us to get a, a magnetic field that is induced in this wire by the current in this wire to point down that means when we use our right hand rule it simply says um, we need to have our current going in which direction remember we want it to go into so that means our current uh, must be going clockwise because if it's going that way it's going into the area right it must dip in it dips down so that the perpendicular vector is directed directly down and opposing that so it means in this segment the current is going that way and then in this segment it's going up so that the field lines go in and then in that segment it's going that way so the field lines are dipping into this area and then here like that so you can tell that the current is going to be going here clockwise as a result to try and oppose the change that is going to be induced by the movement of this wire closer to the current current conductor next we have um, this one B okay so we can tell that here we need a uh, what you call um, the magnetic field here 
must be going in I don't know doesn't really give us a nice one so you can see pink is down so blue is out so maybe let's use that now here already is it blue or green it's green yeah yeah man I took forever and I hate it I don't like it because I just wanted to finish fast man but now yeah got caught in the mix of explanations damn it but anyway guys we are learning isn't it so if you fail to keep the time let's just learn instead all right now here what do we want this one is moving away from this magnetic field so as we move away the magnetic field strength is going to decrease as we move further away from this wire now we said the magnetic flux in this case will change such that it becomes less and less and less and now we said the current opposes any of that change because the EMF is induced in a direction that opposes the change of our magnetic flux change then that means we need our magnetic field due to the current induced in this wire to be going up so that we can add to that magnetic field so that we can retain the strength of that magnetic field isn't it so that means for us to get a current that has a magnetic field whose tangent vector is directed up so that it can add to this one as we move away so that we can keep that strength it has to go that way isn't it because if you're going that way it's coming out so that means in this segment if we're going that way we're coming out in this segment we're going that way we're coming out in this segment we're going that way we're still coming out like that out of this area in this segment we're going that way we're still coming out so this means our direction is going to be anti-clockwise here okay so essentially we wanted one that gives anti-clockwise so b already becomes our answer i mean you can explore the others if you will uh, so this one for example is going that way so the magnetic field is also decreasing so we want to increase it but in which direction is it directed normally by this wire it's down so that means we're going to want to induce a current that also goes in the same direction so that we can add them together and maintain that uh, magnetic field strength so if we want to induce a current that has this magnetic field pointed down like that that means the current must be such that it dips in so that means in this segment the current must be coming that way so that it dips in and therefore the current is going clockwise yay yeah, when uh, am I talking sense now yeah 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 it should be going clockwise so it's going down and then in this segment it's gonna go in so it's going that way then in that segment is going in it's going that way in that segment it's still dipping in so it's clockwise so that's not what we want right here it's moving parallel with this so there will be no change in the magnetic flux here and if there's no change in the magnetic flux there's no EMF if there's no EMF there's no current all right so that's good so B is the answer all right guys I hope you enjoyed the video and I'm sorry that I took longer than I wanted so I took pretty much an hour I think and yet I was planning to do just 30 minutes so these things are not so easy I do feel this question paper by judging on question one was not really easy eh? it's one of those questions you would say higher grade type questions of course there were some easy ones like um, like 1.3 1.3 is pretty simple uh, and 1.5 is pretty simple uh, yeah and 1.9 the rest was pretty much higher grade stuff otherwise guys I hope you liked the video and please continue to work hard and practice as much as you can and thank you also for the work that you guys have been doing you've been sharing the videos with your friends i can see the viewership is increasing and that's commendable work so let's keep working hard thank you for your hard work and keep doing what you're doing 
I will also keep doing what I'm doing and let's work together. Thanks and goodbye for now. See you on the next video when we're tackling question two. Bye-bye.